Hello, and thank you for joining the Pituitary Network Association's webinar program, which is brought to you through the support of our sponsors and our expert contributors. The PNA is dedicated to educating people with pituitary disorders, their families, and their health care providers. PNA is a nonprofit organization that relies on the support from our members and donors. During the webinar, feel free to type in questions at any time, but please note that all questions will be saved until the end of the webinar. We have allotted time to answer as many questions as possible. Today's webinar, Surgical Strategies in the Treatment of Pituitary Tumors, is being presented by Dr. Marco, Mario Zuccarello and Dr. Jonathan Forbes. Dr. Zuccarello is currently a professor of neurosurgery at the University of Cincinnati. He was the Frank H. Mayfield Chair for Neurosurg Neurological Surgery and Chairman of the Department of Neurosurgery from 2009 to 2017. Dr. Zuccarello is also a member of the University of Cincinnati Gardner Neuroscience Institute and the Greater Cincinnati Northern Kentucky Stroke Team. Dr. Zuccarello is dedicated to clinical research in neurovascular disease and the development of new neurosurgical techniques for the treatment of stroke, cerebral hemorrhage, vasospasm, carotid artery disease, and moya moya disease. While Cincinnati has become widely known for its leadership in stroke research, treatment, and the development of clot-busting drugs, Dr. Zuccarello has led a quiet revolution in the prevention and treatment of brain hemorrhages, which rank among the most hazardous conditions of the brain. Dr. Zuccarello graduated summa cum laude from the gymnasium in Catania, Italy in 1970. He received his medical degree from the University of Padova, Italy in 1976 and completed his residency in neurosurgery from Padova with summa cum laude honors in 1980. He subsequently performed research fellowships at the University of Iowa and the University of Virginia Medical Center, Charlottesville, and a clinical fellowship at the University of Cincinnati. He was inducted into the Alpha Omega Alpha, the National Medical Honor Society in 2001, has been named to the best doctors in America since 2005. In 2013, he received recognition by members of the Vasospasm Consortium for his dedication and outstanding accomplishments in the field of experimental and clinical research on subarachnoid hemorrhage. Dr. Forbes is a fellowship-trained neurosurgeon with expertise and interest in open and minimally invasive approaches for treatment of pathology of the cranial base. He has a long and distinguished history of academic recognition, commitment to excellence, and service to our country. As an undergraduate at Grove City College, he was a recipient of the Trustee Scholarship and was named Sportsman of the Year after a senior season of varsity football. Following events of 9-11, he enrolled in the Health Professions Scholarship Program with the United States Air Force. In medical school at the University of Pittsburgh, he was a recipient of the David Glasser Honors Award for academic performance. During neurosurgical residency at Vanderbilt University, he received numerous national accolades, including the AANS Synthes Cranial Facial Award for research in neurotrauma, as well as the AANS Top Gun Award. His score at on the American Board of Neurological Surgery written board examination during his fourth year of res residency was recognized in the top 3% nationwide. After completing his chief year of neurosurgical residency at Vanderbilt in 2013, Dr. Forbes went on to fulfill a four-year commitment with the U.S. Air Force that included a six-month deployment to Bagram Air Force Base in Afghanistan. Humanitarian care he provided at the Craig Joint Theater Hospital in Bagram has been featured as numerous neurosurgical journals, including Journal of Neurosurgery, World Neurosurgery, and Neurosurger Neurosurgical Focus, and recognized on a national level by the U.S. Air Force as part of the Through Airmen's Eyes series. After honorable discharge from the military, he completed a minimally invasive skull-based fellowship at Weill Cornell Medical Center in New York under the guidance of Dr. Theodore Schwartz, prior to joining the UC Department of Neurosurgery. To date, Dr. Forbes has contributed to over 40 peer-reviewed publications. Doctors, thank you so much for your involvement with the PNA's webinar program. And there's going to be a brief delay as we change presenters. And you should see on your end to accept. Okay. Are we ready, Timmy? Yes, now I see your screen. You're good to go. Thank you, Timmy. Also on behalf of Dr. Forbes, thank you for your kind introductions. Uh, this really will make my mother for sure extremely happy. So uh, 
I'd like to welcome all of you. Uh, my name is Mario Zuccarello, uh, and uh, uh, we'll start the, the webinar today. And uh, after this, uh, I will give to Dr. Forbes about, you know, probably the next 15, 20 minutes. Like Tammy said, please uh, write all your questions, and we'll be more than happy to answer the best of our abilities. So the the title is Surgical Strategies in the Treatment of Pituitary Tumors. So most of you, uh, I need to advance, let's see. Something is not advancing, Tammy. Let me see. Okay, so uh, most of you know what pituitary tumors are. Just to remind you, pituitary tumors are called also pituitary adenomas, and they come from the cells of the pituitary gland. Very important is to uh, identify the locations. So in this slide, and I tried to use the mouse uh, uh, somehow, in a, you can see two arrows. One is the blue, the one is the green. The blue is pointing directly to the gland. And the green is showing to you a very important structure, which you will probably have some more knowledge in the next few slides, which is called the optic nerve and the optic chiasma. The optic system in general is a very, very delicate and if you have a growth from the tumor, the optic system can be damaged, can be compressed, and, and is one of the major triggers for any surgical intervention. So this will give you somehow a GPS, a location of the pituitary gland and the relationship of the pituitary gland with the base of the skull and with the optic nerve and the optic chiasma. So, when you talk about pituitary tumors, a few facts, which I think are very important for you and also for your family members and you uh, uh, in general. So, first of all, the pituitary tumors or pituitary adenomas, they are benign. Very rarely they're cancerous. So, 98% they are benign tumors. What is not too benign is the hormonal effect because this pituitary adenomas will build into your bloodstream so high level of some special hormones, and those hormones can really have a negative effect on you. The second element is a frequently asked question is how often this happens. When you look at the MRI studies, the presence of a pituitary adenomas in a population seem to be one out 1,000. You understand that it's not really very common, but it's not so uncommon as well, but it's one in 1,000. It's, it's not really everyday uh, type of tumors. The other thing which is also frequently asked is, if I have a pituitary tumor, what happened to my family members? Well, the cases of familial pituitary adenomas, pituitary tumors, are very rare. So if you have this type of tumor, uh, don't be so upset about your family members, your children, or whoever else, your brothers, sisters, because this is probably not affect them. So what is the role of the pituitary gland? We already have already and somehow uh, told you that the pituitary gland is a place where the hormones are really built up. So the gland is the master hormone gland. And the hormones are this very small chemical signals. They are put into the bloodstream, they circulate into the bloodstream, and they stop in several stations. So each station is an organ in your body. And the hormones tend to regulate the function of those organs. So the hormones are really very important. It's equally important to maintain the, the proper level of the hormones. So when the pituitary gland releases the hormones, the function is regulated well. 
when the pituitary glands release too much of hormones, like we will see the next few slides, then the function of many other organs can be affected negatively. So that's the very important concept uh, of the hormones and the proper release of hormones. Okay, so this is the general information about the gland, which you may have, but it's good to just remind. So, how are pituitary tumors or pituitary adenomas discovered? Number one is obvious. Like we said, if the hormones put in the bloodstream, the hormones level, the hormonal level is too high, this is one way of the tumors are discovered. So people would have some blood work, and then they find that, they, they, that particular hormone is very high. So th there's a red flag, and then your physician will get an MRI to see whether there's a, a pituitary tumor. If you have a large tumor, those large tumors, if you remember the slide where I showed the, the pituitary gland and the optic nerves, well, if the tumor is large enough, can compress the optic nerves. If you have a compression of the optic nerves, unfortunately, you may have a dysfunction of your vision. It can be a loss of peripheral vision, can be even deterioration of your visual acuity. So how far you can see and how blurry your vision can be. If the tumor is large enough, it can also damage the rest of the gland. And so if you have a rest of the gland that damages, it's not only you have a, too much hormones of one type, which is secreted by the, the tumor, but also you have a deficiency of other type of hormones which should be secreted by the residual gland. So you have, unfortunately, a double negative effect if you have a large tumor. Too much hormones of one type, which can damage organs, and not enough hormones of the other types because the normal gland is damaged. Okay, I think this is, concept is very, very important. Sometimes you combination of the above, and, and many other times, pituitary tumors can be discovered incidentally. For instance, I have a head injury, I go to the emergency room, they do a scan, they see a tumor. So the tumor never gave to me any symptoms, but it's there, and somebody will find it. And then, of course, the decision making will be what I do with this tumor, which we can discuss, it will be happy to answer if you have questions that type. So let's go let's move forward. So the pituitary tumors can be small, can be large. Smaller than 10 millimeters, micro, and microadenoma larger than 10 millimeters. And you have two examples. The top, you can see the two arrows, the blue and the green, shows a small tumor with the, 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 the blue, and the green is the optic system. You can see there's a distance between the tumor and the optic system. So, in that case, what we expected to find, somebody who has perfect vision or whatever vision is not damaged, and maybe that tumor put too much of hormones in the bloodstream. Conversely, when you look at the image on the bottom, you can see a very, very large tumor, which is shown by the large blue hairs. And then the optic chiasma, the optic system, is also pointed by the green hair. And you can see it's very thin. So we expect to have some visual problems. And so you can see the difference in these two instances of large tumor, small tumors, what a small tumors can do, what a large tumors can do. And I hope this will be clear. So I'll give you a quick, very, very quick as, uh, picture of the hormones, the action of the hormones, and the most frequent pituitary adenoma secreting an excess of hormones. So the LH and FSH are typically uh, uh, important for production of testosterone or estrogen, and also for sperm production and ovulation. So you can see they are very important in a sexual function and eventually in, in the pregnancy, in the pregnancy development. Uh, the, TSH is important to maintain an LT thyroid function. Prolactin is very important at the end of the, of the pregnancy to be able to uh, have milk production and so uh, to uh, or then uh, do this for uh, your, your, your child uh, uh, nourishment. And the GH 
It's important because they regulate the growth of muscle in bones. If you have too much of growth hormones and the marker is called the IGF-1, if you have too much of that, the patient has a very large bones, particularly. The, the, the jaw is very large. So the face is really changing significantly. You can see in, in pictures in some of these patients affected by acromegaly, how they, in the 10 years before and 10 years later, they're very, very different. Or there's a growth in the hands, and particularly, obviously, the growth in the feet. And sometimes the patients say, well, um, um, my uh, shoes were, I don't know, 11. And then two years later, they are 12, and then 13, 14, because there's such enlargement of the cartilages and larger the bones, okay? So this is very frequent, the acromegaly, very frequently found the pituitary tumors secreting too much of this growth hormone. The other one is ACTH, which control the steroids, the cortisol production of your body, and controls the adrenal gland. So, if unfortunately there's too much of production, this is the, the so-called Cushing's disease. So Cushing disease is not a very, it's not a benign problem because when you have too much cortisol, there are so many other organs are negatively affected, and so this is something which needs to be taken care of pretty rapidly. The ADH and the oxytocin, they are two hormones which are present and regulate the body hydration and the contraction of the uterus, and also in a, in a uh, pretty funny way, the oxytocin is called the hormones of love, or the love hormones, because if somebody's love seems to have more oxytocin in the bloodstream, so watch out for that. <laughs> this is uh, a synopsis, a, a summary of the most frequently hormones, the action, and the three most frequently found adenoma with excess production of prolactin, uh, growth hormones, and cortisol. So, so why do you want to treat a pituitary adenoma? So if the tumor is small, you don't treat because of the vision problems. Because remember what I showed you in that picture, the chiasma, the optic system was pretty far, so it's not under any risk. However, if the small tumor put too much hormones in a bloodstream, and cannot be treated medically, then surgery is an option. And so it's important to, to know that. If you have a large tumor and the, you have already damage uh, or somehow the peripheral vision or the uh, vision in general, the so blurred vision, the acuity of the ability to read it, and of course, need to be treated because it's the only way to recover your vision. If you have a large tumor and you put a lot of hormones, on the bloodstream, or if you remember what I said, sometimes it can be so big that then the whatever is left of the regular gland is not working well, and you have a deficiency of hormones. So for males, for instance, a lot of testosterone, it, it can be impotent. For in, in, a, in a thyroid, if it is a hypothyroid, it's, it's a big problem. But if you don't have enough growth hormone, then there's a, 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 a lack of growth or maybe and many other problems with the muscles in general or the bones. And if you don't have enough cortisol, uh, you can even die because your blood pressure can be so low. So if you have all this stuff, the large tumors has to be treated one way or the other. So let's go a little bit on the treatment. So the three major positions or, or four can treat your pituitary tumor. One is the endocrinologist, the other one is the radiation therapist, and the other one is the neurosurgeon backslash uh, e e autolaryngology, the ENT. I put backslash because this is a team approach. So in surgery, you have a team, neuro neurosurgeons and ENT. In your assessment, you have a team, the endocrinologist, the radiation, and the neurosurgeons, the surgeons in general. So the treatment of pituitary adenoma is very, very clear to your mind. It's a team approach. You go to a place where they don't have a team. Uh, I don't know if you want to be treated there. You need to have a group of physicians dedicated. So the endocrinologist will try to treat with medications, and sometimes it's possible. The radiation oncologist will give a special radiation, so-called radiosurgery, 
and uh, in some instances works well. And the neurosurgeons will take the tumor out to cure at once your problem. So let me go on the medical therapy. There's a significant improvement on medical therapy in the past probably 10 years, 15 years. One medication which is very, very commonly used is cabercolin. This is mainly used for prolactinoma. So the tumors which you put in the bloodstream, a lot of prolactin. The way this cabercolin works is to not only stop the growth, but try to shrink it actually. And so in many instances, about 75%, 80% of the cases, when you have a prolactinoma, you want to try first with medical management. And not everybody tolerate the medical management, but it's first line of attack. If somebody has acromegaly, so it, it develops big bones, the, it really faces changes significantly, the feet, remember, get very large. Uh, it, it, you have a change in the muscles and bones. So, uh, because of too much growth hormones, there's been some development in the medical therapy, but both the octreotide and other variations, or the big visomint, they are both used, but the success rate of the medical manager in acromegaly is not very high. You can try, but it's not very high. In Cushing, unfortunately, the medical management is equally not very high. And so there have been some attempt of treatment. It's sometimes when you have such a bad health, you can have surgery, maybe medical management can be attempted. So, but has been significant uh, improvement, and maybe the research in the future will provide us with better medical management, avoiding invasive procedures. So what are the indications for surgery? And then I will ask Dr. Forbes uh, to take over this webinar and to show to you some fancy pictures also in surgeries. First of all, surgery is the first line of treatment for most of pituitary tumors. With the exception of probably prolactinoma, because like I said, the medical management seems to work in many instances. When medical management or radiation fails, then surgery is always indicated. It's indicated in some cases we call pituitary apoplexy. I will explain to you in a simple way. So sometimes the pituitary gland, which is a lot of blood flow inside, goes through a process of bleeding inside, creating a blood clot into the gland. This is called pituitary apoplexy. In the, when you have pituitary apoplexy, the gland or the tumor in the gland will become much larger. And so can compress the optic system or can compress some of the nerves which are around the area of the pituitary gland. And so patient can present with uh, double vision or the eyelid doesn't open up well. So in those instances, surgery may be not only life-saving, but will be function-saving, and so it can be indicated. And of course, uh, surgery is indicated, like we said many times, to provide an immediate relief from excess of hormonal secretion, a mass effect. Typical example, somebody has the acromegaly, so which means too much growth hormone. If you do surgery, the level goes down immediately, and so the patient gradually will have relief really in a few weeks. So you change it in the face, the, 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 the size of the hands and the feet. So it's very dramatic. It's, very, it's really great. And also, if it's a large tumor, the compression of the optic nerve will, will get will practically disappears, and the vision can improve gradually in the course of several weeks. So this is the main indication for surgery. Remember, you, we try medical management if it's indicated. We try maybe radiation in a few, few instances, but otherwise surgery seems to be at this point of this other game in 2018, the to 19 is, is really the major player. So these are two surgical strategies. One is coming from the yellow one through the, the brain, practically open the skull, open a window in the surgery. And the other one is coming through the nose. So at this point, I will thank you for listening to me. I hope I gave you some information and I hope you have questions and I will ask Dr. Forbes to complete the webinar. Thank you. Okay, well, well thanks very much, Dr. Uh, Zuccarello. And uh, I just uh, firstly would like to say that uh, it's really a great uh, privilege uh, for me to to, uh, to join in this webinar with Dr. Zuccarello, who's uh, 
it's really a spectacular uh, a neurosurgeon. And uh, and so uh, so briefly, uh, we had talked about the uh, the surgical uh, strategies, which include coming from ab above via cranial approach, and coming from the nose via an endonasal approach. And uh, so uh, this uh, this harkens back to the uh, the the history of open microsurgical approaches to to approach the uh, pituitary gland, and uh, Nowadays, we prefer uh, minimally invasive approaches, uh, predominantly endonasal approaches. But uh, his historically, uh, open microsurgical approaches like the one that's pictured here were used to access tumors of the pituitary gland. And so, uh, and so uh, these uh, surgical strategies included, uh, you can see some of the medical terminology here, the transfacial and transcranial approaches, so very large approaches uh, to access these uh, pituitary tumors, and uh, we we uh, uh, you can look here and 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 see uh, uh, some pictures uh, that uh, depict some of these uh, uh, invasive uh, skull base approaches. And so, um, progressively over time, these open approaches uh, uh, have uh, become uh, progressively uh, smaller. And uh, so you can see in some of the images uh, uh, depicted here. Uh, in the middle image, uh, in, the, in the far left image, a uh, what's called a terional craniotomy. In the middle image, a uh, supraorbital uh, uh, craniotomy. And in the far right, a uh, superior eyelid incision for a transorbital uh, craniotomy. So uh, fortunately, uh, e even, though the, even though these uh, open approaches have become less and less invasive, fortunately nowadays, uh, uh, most of the time with these tumors, we're, we're able to go through the nose and to do minimally invasive endonasal approaches. And, um, and so what is this minimally invasive concept? And so, uh, so minimal exposure, uh, minimal trauma, and uh, importantly, uh, the minimally invasive endonasal concept is a way to optimize trajectory to the pituitary gland. And uh, so these approaches have been shown to facilitate a more prompt recovery and uh, a reduced uh, pain and a reduced length of stay in the hospital. But these minimally invasive approaches are at least as efficacious as some of these historical open microsurgical approaches in their ability uh, to facilitate removal of these tumors. And, um, and so this is a picture which uh, kind of shows you, uh, uh, this is an older image that shows you uh, uh, an open uh, microsurgical approach uh, to a pituitary tumor. And uh, so you can see the, uh, the tumor which is uh, displacing the optic nerves uh, with the uh, carotid artery uh, pictured uh, to the right. So fortunately, this is not an image that we see uh, very frequently uh, uh, anymore, although uh, sometimes with very, very large tumors uh, with significant uh, temporal and anterior fossa extension, uh, these, uh, uh, these uh, open microsurgical approaches are, are indicated. And uh, so uh, 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 the minimally invasive endoscopic transphenoidal approach uh, nowadays is, uh, is really effective in uh, 95%, uh, approximately 95% of these cases. Um, so in, in this approach, a, uh, a camera is delivered uh, through the, uh, the nasal cavity uh, to, uh, uh, to the sphenoid bone, and, uh, and work can be done through the nasal cavity. So there are no external incisions, um, and so uh, much of the work is done through air-filled passageways. And so really, uh, which really serves to uh, minimize pain uh, uh, following surgery. So, uh, so what are the advantages of this approach? There's a shorter distance uh, 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 to the target, effective distance. Uh, the camera can be de delivered to the site where, uh, where the dissection and tumor removal is necessary. And so there's improved visualization. Uh, there's improved uh, exposure. And so sometimes uh, in these cases, uh, it's uh, it's very necessary to preserve the optic structures and the blood uh, the blood supply to the optic structures, and so there's improved visualization and exposure. There's decreased operative time and decreased blood loss, 
uh, uh, no brain, uh, unlike the, uh, some of these historical open microsurgical approaches, no brain retraction is necessary. Uh, there's decreased exposure of non-involved structures and cosmetic benefits because there's no external incision. Uh, and so the endoscopic endonasal transphenoidal approach is simple, versatile, and effective. And uh, so this is really the anatomy uh, that's, uh, that's familiar to uh, uh, most neurosurgeons who, who, who uh, do this approach. And so you can see this is an endonasal uh, approach. And uh, 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 the, uh, the sphenoid bone is pictured on the center of this image. And so you can see the, uh, the cella there, uh, which is where these uh, tumors arise. And so you can see the carotid arteries are on either side of the cella. And uh, the optic apparatus is uh, what, what we would say is uh, above or rostral to the cella. And uh, so in this image, the face of the sphenoid has been opened and we're looking directly into the sphenoid sinus. And, uh, and so uh, uh, you, can, you can see that this, uh, exposure, uh, this approach provides excellent exposure to the, uh, the region of, uh, invo uh, involved by the tumor. And uh, so, so this is an image uh, that, uh, that uh, demonstrates uh, uh, kind of the vantage that's provided from a transphenoidal approach. And so you can see here that the, uh, if the tuberculum cella is removed, the op optic chiasm is visible. Uh, you can see uh, the uh, 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 pituitary stalk and the pituitary gland, and you can see the superior hypophyseal artery. Uh, I will say that in, in most uh, pituitary tumors, uh, this uh, degree of removal is, is not required, but it does uh, demonstrate the, the uh, very relevant anatomy. And uh, so this is an operative uh, view provided uh, during an endoscopic approach. And so you can see again the cella in the image in the upper left, and you can see after the cella has been opened, the image of, uh, of the gland and uh, the, the associated tumor. Uh, with angled scopes, it's possible to visualize the, the cavernous sinus, uh, which tumors can sometimes uh, invade. And so uh, important concepts to uh, uh, minimally invasive endoscopic endonasal transphenoidal approaches. Uh, the first concept is image guidance, and we'll talk more about that in, in, uh, in a subsequent image. Uh, the, the approach, uh, the techniques that are used uh, with endoscopic approaches are very important in the use of uh, uh, optimizing the use of long shaft instrumentation that's required. Uh, refinements in this instru instrumentation have been very important, as have closure techniques, which have uh, proven in instrumental uh, in uh, continuing to decrease the risk of uh, postoperative uh, CSF fistula or spinal fluid leakage. Um, operative skill, uh, uh, so uh, these approaches are associated with a, with a learning curve uh, and uh, 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 a very uh, uh, acute knowledge of uh, anatomic structures that are encountered is, is also important. And so this is a slide that, uh, that uh, depicts uh, CT and image guidance. And so uh, you can see here that during surgery, uh, it's possible to register uh, patients uh, to uh, neuronavigation. And so you can see that it's possible you see the crosshairs here. Here, that this uh, this technology serves as a, uh, a form of uh, GPS uh, that that uh, we have available in the operating room, and so it's possible at, at, at any point during surgery to uh, uh, to confirm the uh, the anatomic location uh, using uh, this uh, this platform. And uh, so, what are other uh, technical techni technological improvements. Uh, so there have been refinements in instrumentation. Um, and so you can see uh, 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 instrumentation here uh, that's really formatted for keyhole approaches using a pinch apparatus and bayoneted instruments, uh, the pistol grip instruments. Uh, uh, the uh, pistol grip bipolar is uh, uh, demonstrated here. Uh, closure techniques are very important. And so you can see in the bottom right, a, uh, a depiction of, uh, of a historical closure technique that's been used uh, following uh, endoscopic endonasal approaches. Uh, uh, nowadays, for very large uh, pituitary tumors, it's common to utilize a uh, nasoceptal flap coverage, uh, which uh, has been very useful 
in, uh, uh, in minimizing uh, the risk of uh, postoperative CSF fistula. And uh, so the need for a nasoceptal flap will uh, vary on a case-by-case -case uh, uh, basis, but uh, especially uh, in larger macroadenomas, uh, 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 it's uh, a very useful adjunct. And uh, so this is a video of a uh, endoscopic endonasal uh, approach, uh, just a very quick video. And you can see the large tumor uh, that's present uh, 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 that is a pituitary adenoma. This is after the bony removal, and you can see the dura. And we're using angled scissors uh, to open the dura, and the tumor is immediately visible. And so we're working in the sphenoid sinus. And the tumor consistency in this case was uh, favorable. And so you can see that's the diaphragma cella, and so that's the arachnoid uh, that's located over the tumor. Here you can see the normal tumor gland, and um, and so uh, the tumor here has been resected, and uh, uh, so you can see the the gland. Uh, in in this case, the tumor involved the cavernous sinus, and so now we're using angled scopes and angled instruments really to maximize removal of tumor, not only in the cella but also in the cavernous sinus. And so this is after removal of the tumor. Uh, hemostasis is obtained with gel foam and Surgicel. And uh, we then uh, utilize the nasoceptal flap uh, to cover uh, this tumor. And you can see we're able to achieve a very aggressive resection of this tumor, um, including the component uh, in the cavernous sinus. And, uh, and so uh, uh, these endoscopic endonasal approaches are useful even in uh, cases like this, which is a, uh, a case of Dr. Zuccarello's of a massive uh, pituitary microad uh, macroadenoma. And uh, you can see in the post-op Im images here, uh, gross total resection of even these very, very large tumors is possible uh, through these endoscopic and nasal approaches. And uh, uh, so what are the risks of pituitary surgery? Uh, fortunately, the risks are very low. Uh, major morbidity uh, is, uh, is very rare. And, and that could include hormonal, uh, permanent hormonal balance after surgery, uh, something called diabetes insipidus, uh, which is a form of hormonal imbalance. Um, uh, these, uh, 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 these types of uh, morbidity can be uh, controlled uh, using uh, uh, with oral medications. There's also the risk uh, that we talked about of a spinal fluid leak that could require a lumbar drain insertion or even another, uh, another surgery to fix uh, the leak. Uh, uh, fortunately, cases of visual loss and, uh, and stroke after surgery are extremely rare. Uh, minor morbidity after surgery can include uh, nasal congestion and uh, sinonasal discomfort and uh, uh, temporary diabetes insipidus. And uh, so this is a, a very uh, safe uh, form of surgery. And uh, so endoscopic uh, surgery is safe. It allows for complete removal of uh, even very large uh, tumors. Uh, the importance of a, a team endoscopic approach uh, is, is critical with ENT and uh, neurosurgery. And, uh, and so, uh, uh, so anterior, uh, so I, uh, uh, this uh, concludes uh, the, uh, the webinar. So I just would like to, on behalf of Dr. Zuccarello, would like to thank everyone for uh, for tuning in. Thank you, Doctors. Yeah. That was excellent. Uh, we I mean, we uh, do if, if, you, if you have any uh, questions, uh, I don't see the questions on the. the no, you, you won't see them. I do see them on my oh, end, okay. though. We do have a few. Um, okay. First question: I am currently taking some of our two times a week on octreotide acetate LAR one time a month. I have achieved a normal IGF but remain symptomatic. I had the transfernoidal surgery and then the cyber knife, but there is still a small remaining tumor that is sitting the right inner carotid that they say is now inoperable. They are considering stopping my medication, but I am concerned my symptoms will get even worse. Any ideas what I should do? I have had abduction surgery on my shoulder. I have developed diabetes, multiple bone bone joint problems, sleep apnea, difficult to intubate. They had to do an awake intubation for my breast cancer surgery. I have had redundant colon. I have had carpal tunnel surgery. 
not caused by using my wrist. Sharp pains in my head that come and go as I have severe diverticulitis that they say this past year caused hemorrhaging from a diverticuli that started to bleed and stopped on its own. I do have other problems, but the point is I do not feel comfortable going off the injection medication. That at least ended there. I know that was a lot. So. Yeah, Tim, I think it was uh, a lot. I, I think the main question is <coughs> patient had surgery, mm -hmm. uh, still a residual tumor. Right. Uh, and and the, the, the surgeons do not feel that the tumor can be resected safely. Mm -hmm. so, uh, she already had radiation, if I understood correctly. Yes, cyber knife. Okay, cyber knife. And, uh, and uh, the, so the IGF value is controlled, but unfortunately the symptoms are not disappearing, okay? Mm -hmm. So I, I, I think the, uh, at this point, uh, given the significant a number of other uh, medical problems, okay, than than she has. Uh, I, I I think a, a, even if a surgery was an option, I would not consider a part of the, the treatment. So uh, she's left uh, uh, with two options. One is to uh, continue the medical management and the control of the IGF. Uh, although the symptoms are not necessarily disappearing. However, I'm sure they are now worse, and, and the stabilization of symptoms is sometimes is also in a goal um, than you can aim to, okay? Uh, so the other one is, uh, in some instances, a radiation can be repeated. Now, uh, we frequently use a gamma knife, uh, and a cyber knife I'm, uh, is something I never use. It. Uh, but you know, gamma knife is very precise, and if you have a small residual uh, in, um, in proximity of the common sinus, which I believe this is what she meant, uh, the uh, I would give a consultation also uh, with any place where they provide the gamma knife treatments. Uh, so I think that's the recommend. I will ask Dr. Forbes if you want to add anything else to the question. Yeah, no, I, I think uh, I think that I would agree with what uh, Dr. Dr. Zuccarello uh, had said. I, I think it's uh, it's a little bit uh, difficult for us to make very broad statements without seeing the individual uh, imaging uh, uh, that's uh, associated with this case. But um, but but it sounds like that it's uh, uh, perhaps the uh, the residual tumor is uh, is uh, not. Uh, uh, you know, not ideal for uh, repeat surgery, which uh, sometimes can be considered, but that would that would that would depend on a case by case uh, basis. And it sounds like that the IGF one uh, level has has uh, has normalized, which I think is uh, uh, on medical therapy and with radiation. And and I think that that's a very important thing, and is probably the uh, uh, the most important part of of the treatment. And uh, otherwise, I, I would. Uh, I would absolutely agree with with what uh, Dr. Dr. Zuccarello had said. So. Thank you. I hope that this will help. Okay. Okay. Um, I have a giant prolactinoma, growth controlled with cabergoline. Most everything under control. Vision has not been affected, but I'm having grand mal seizures. Is surgery a wise choice? Um. And, and so the uh, and I'm sorry. Uh, so the giant prolactinoma and what was uh, what was the statement about growth? Uh, has the growth of the prolactinoma is controlled with cabergoline. I see. Okay. And so it sounds like that with uh, so so those those are really the questions. So I'd want to know with the prolactinoma, uh, how much has the tumor shrunk on cabergoline, and I'd want to know what the prolactin levels uh, have done. And so. And that's uh, that's really the question: is uh, is is this uh, seizure activity related to uh, mass effect uh, from the tumor, uh, or is there? Uh, it, it sounds like that, that uh, potentially that, that these are new onset seizures uh, that have come come about after discovery of the tumor. And uh, so, so I think that those are the questions that I'd be interested in. I'd want to know how much the tumor had shrunk, and what the prolactin levels uh, had had done. 
I, I think in, it, uh, it sounds like in this case that, that medical therapy is, is working appropriately. And I, I, I think that there is, uh, you have to be careful uh, about uh, uh, assuming that the, uh, the, uh, that the seizures are uh, secondary to this mass effect, although in, in some cases that is possible. Um, but I think that this is a case where I, where I would like to see the individual images uh, before and after treatment with cabergoline and the laboratory values. And, uh, Dr. Zuccarello, what, what do you think about this case? Well, it is, it's very intriguing um, to have a prolactinoma and uh, onset of seizures. So I think it would be quite important to know from uh, this patient uh, the temporal profile of the development of the seizures. Uh, did he had any seizure prior to the discovery of prolactinoma, or did they just came after the this? And that, and is there any coincidence between the cobergoline treatment and the seizure? So that's very important. He, he has uh, answered a couple of your questions. Um, so the tumor was discovered because of the seizures. And oh, prolactin okay. lum numbers are normal, although just increased cobergoline to keep them in range. And not much shrinkage, but the growth has stopped. Okay, so uh, what I would suggest is that uh, she will need a workup in, uh, for the seizures, because probably the tumor was found by coincidence, uh, and the two are not necessarily related. So uh, I would just go to a center where they do uh, the workup for seizures, understand if she has uh, any area of the brain which is. Uh, uh, creating a what we call a focus, so area of discharge, electrical discharge, sustaining the seizures, a and uh, only if there is any proximity of this to the tumor, I would then conclude that maybe the tumor is responsible, and the eventual surgery may be an option. But uh, otherwise, I, I would treat the two independently. Thank you. How long is the recovery and downtime after surgery for a microadenoma prolactinoma? Well, the, the, the surgery done endoscopically um, carries much uh, lower need of a lengthy recover because it is much less invasive than going through the, uh, to the, to the, to the skull. So saying that uh, a case which is done without a, any any complications, no spinal fluid leakage, no other issues, no infections. Uh, typically, it goes home in two or three days and then uh, can uh, go back to work, depending on the type of work you do, of course. If you do heavy work, or maybe you wait a little bit longer. But in general, in two or three weeks, you, you're back to work. John, what do you think? Any yeah, I think uh, I, I would agree with Dr. Zuccarello. I think that this is a surgery uh, it's done through the uh, air-filled uh, sinus cavities and it's tolerated very well uh, with, uh, with not very much in the way of pain after surgery. And I would agree with Dr. Zuccarello. I think p patients bounce back very quickly after, after this type of procedure. So I would say two to three weeks. Great, thank you. In Canada, cabergoline is becoming harder to find. Do you know why and how long the shortage of the drug will last? Uh, you know, that, that's an excellent question. And, uh, and I'm not, I, I don't know that I have an answer to the question. Uh, I do know that there are a few different preparations of, uh, of uh, these medications, which I believe are dopamine agonists. And, uh, and so I'm, I'm not sure exactly uh, uh, I don't really know the specifics, um, but but I do know that sometimes, depending on the preparation, uh, uh, one patient might be uh, have uh, uh, symptoms referable to one preparation, and then maybe asymptomatic with another preparation. And so, uh, uh, I do hope that uh, that in this case, uh, uh, that there are ways to uh, uh, to obtain the uh, cabergoline, and and I don't know that I have a uh, uh, very insightful answer, unfortunately, to this question. Well, Timmy, unfortunately, uh, I, I can't say much more than that. I mean, I'm, I'm aware of some of this uh, shortages, uh, and uh, many times when you have a, a drug shortage, it's really uh, a company-related problem. 
Okay, so I, I don't know if this is an issue uh, between the, the the company and the, and the government in the Canada uh, or the different provinces. I uh, but I know that the the company who makes cabergolin is Actavis Pharma Company, and uh, they uh, uh, they just there's no specification that I am aware of. I'm sorry. Okay. Thank you. Um, if vision has been damaged by apoplexy, can a later later surgery help correct it? Well, the if vision is damaged by pituitary apoplexy, uh, a, a, the and the procedure, the surgery is done very quickly uh, to take the pressure of the optic nerve or the chiasma, in general, the optic system, okay? Uh, in general, you have a recovery, uh, which is pretty pretty quick, pretty fast. Uh, if you have no recovery, most of the times, unfortunately, uh, is permanent, uh, because the damage occurs in such a, a quick fashion, damaging what essentially is the blood supply so if you don't have enough blood going to the organ on your, on, on your body, including the optic nerve, then the, the optic nerve cannot function. So in those instances, you have a, a cutoff in the blood supply. So, uh, 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 so the, the damage, unfortunately, many times is permanent. And uh, to do procedures uh, to correct the vision, it's really not helping because it's a, a primary damage of your optic nerve. It's not a damage of your retina. It's not damage of your, uh, uh, you know, lens or the cornea. It's a primary damage of the optic nerve. So th that is why, if somebody suffers of acute onset of loss of vision, has to seek for immediate clinical attention because it's a little bit like strokes. Okay, any minutes will count. John, you want? Yeah, I, I would agree with Doctor what Doctor Zuccarello. Uh, 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 said and and uh, a lot of times the uh, uh, you know the, these cases of uh, visual loss uh, uh, in, in many cases we'll we'll, we'll see uh, uh, very considerable very considerable improvement uh, uh, following surgery uh, for uh, pituitary apoplexy but I think it does depend on uh, you know some sometimes you have small bleeds uh, that that are uh, that are mildly symptomatic, and, and uh, in rare cases, there can be very large bleeds associated with a great deal of pressure. And um, and so, uh, uh, you know, I think probably the only thing that I would say, and it, it, it sounds like in, in, in this case uh, that that uh, uh, that this was uh, done, but but I, I I think it's it's probably important to make sure that there's no residual compression on. Uh, on on repeat imaging, and I, I think, uh, uh, it, assuming that that's the case, I, I, I think uh, that, that, that this is just a case where uh, of a, uh, a large bleed under a significant amount of pressure uh, that unfortunately had had, uh, had caused uh, irreversible uh, damage to the to the optic structures. Okay, thank you. Um, my doctor wants to send me to a neurologist. Um, you talked about the doctors that treat pituitary tumors. You didn't mention a neurologist. Do neurologists treat pituitary tumors? Uh, sure. So I can I can talk briefly about that. So um, so uh, you know, typically with pituitary tumors, uh, uh, typically the core team is going to be uh, uh, the the neurosurgeon and uh, the endocrinologist. And also, uh, if surgery is is indicated, then uh, otolaryngologist uh, uh, to help with with exposure. Um, and uh, you know, in, in some instances, uh, uh, a neurology uh, uh, neurologist can uh, provide uh, useful information in the care of these tumors. And uh, uh, specifically, uh, you know, uh, in the case of the patient that we had talked about previously. Uh, who had seizures referable to the pituitary tumor, 
um, uh, you know, that uh, neurology, neurology input would be very important. Uh, sometimes uh, some of the, uh, uh, the side effects of the medication can overlap with uh, uh, side effects of medications used, for instance, to treat prolactinomas can overlap uh, with, uh, 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 with uh, neurologic symptoms. And so um, I, I, uh, I would say that uh, in many cases, uh, seeking a neurology consultation is, is useful. Uh, um, and uh, I don't know, Dr. Zagrola. Yeah, I mean, the, the neurologist, of course, are the expert in the neurological diseases. And uh, to some extent, the presence of a pituitary tumor is part of neuroscience. So. Uh, I'm not surprised that a neurologist may be uh, able and uh, not only able, capable and knowledgeable enough to treat pituitary tumors. Uh, typically, uh, in a structure where you have a team approach, like I described in the beginning, when you have your endocrinologist, your ophthalmologist, you have uh, the radiation oncologist, you have the neurosurgeon, the otolaryngologist. Typically, those patients are treated by this group of physicians. But I'm sure that in some communities where maybe you don't have the structure, the neurologist will provide the significant information. So I think a, a, a good neurologist with knowledgeable about pituitary tumor may be a good, uh, you know, uh, way to treat a, a patient. So uh, I, 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 we don't have in our in our group uh, a neurologist because traditionally they don't treat it. But I'm sure that you can find some neurologists capable. Okay, thank you. Um, back to uh, kind of a follow-up to a question we had earlier um, about the seizures. Is it not possible that pressure on temporal lobe can cause seizures? It, it's, it's possible. But that's why, if you remember, Dr. Forbes said, you know, we need to see the images to understand the, the extent of the growth of this tumor. If the tumor is, is so large, it growing in the direction of the what we call the middle fossa, which is the temporal lobe, is possible. The other thing is, like I said, if you a, a, a go to a neurologist specialized in the seizures control, a, and they will do some of the studies to determine whether the area of non-normal electrical discharge, which is the base of it in a seizures, okay, is located exactly in the area where the tumor is attached to the temporal lobe. So the answer, yes, it's possible, but you need to have some more studies to determine whether this, the two are connected. Excellent, thank you. Uh, I do not see any more questions at this point. Uh, thank you, Dr. Zucro. Thank you, Dr. Forbes. Excellent. Very valuable I mean, information. Thank you so much, and I, I'm sorry, but I, I, like Dr. Forbes did, I like to thank whoever participated in the webinars. Yeah, they, they are the heroes. We are trying to provide the best information we can, and we'll be always available if anyone wants to send to us images, whatever. We, of course, we will be reviewing, provide the information and will be available to all of them, okay? <laughs> okay, well, in that same respect, I just got a message. Will the doctors have lunch with me if I buy them a beer? <laughs> 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 uh, oh, you guys are great. <laughs> you ask great questions, and <laughs> thank you all so much for participating today. <laughs> that was great afternoon. Thank you. Thank, <laughs> thank you. you. too. This concludes today's webinar presentation. We appreciate you taking the time to join us. If you missed any of this, any part of this webinar, or if you'd like to share it with family or friends, it will be available on our website, pituitary.org, after it is edited. There will be a brief survey after the webinar. Please fill it out to help us provide you with the information you need. Thank you for joining us, and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank, Thank you. you. Oh, and someone asked for the contact info. I will get that to you. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.